Buonasera, welcome. Uh, I'm happy. My name is Linda Campani, for those of you who might not know me. I'm the director of this program, which is the Breyer Center for Overseas Studies of Stanford University here in Florence. And I have the honor and the distinct pleasure of introducing Professor Luigi Pistaferri tonight. Uh, professor Pistaferri is a professor of economics at Stanford University and together with his wife and three children is in residence at our program for the spring quarter. So he'll be here for three months and he's teaching a class for our students here at the program. Originally from Naples, his name is a giveaway, not that, you have, that, is, that you're from Naples, but you're Italian. Originally from Naples, Pistaferri holds a, a number of degrees. He has a, a laurea uh, uh, from the Istituto Universitario Navale, which is known today as the Università degli Studi di Napoli Partenope in Naples. He also has a PhD in economics from the University College in London, and he has a doctorate in economic sciences, again, from the IUN in Naples. He joined the Stanford University in 1999 after finishing his PhD, and has been a member of the faculty ever since. His re he is a research fellow at the National Bureau, Bureau of Economic Research and also at the Center for Economic Policy Research as well as the Institute for the Study of Labor. In addition, Professor Pistaferri is a Ralph Landau Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economics and Policy and one of the editors of the American Economic Review. His papers and books are on the intersection between labor economics and macroeconomics and have been published in all major economics peer-reviewed journals. He is currently working on a book entitled Consumption, Theory, and Applications. Today is our speaker of the spring 2015 Incontri Palazzo lecture series. Professor Pistaferri will be discussing inequality causes and consequences. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation to speak and thank you for having elected to come teach at the program for the spring. So thanks Linda for a nice introduction and for um, having me here for the whole quarter. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a, a topic that is increasing um, is increasingly popular. Uh, inequality. The background, uh, many of you would know, uh, most countries have witnessed a dramatic increase in income and wage inequality over the last uh, 35 years. Um, and the trends are, um, these trends are for the United States. So this talk is going to be a little bit uh, US centric, uh, not only because US is the country where these trends have been um, very prominent, but also because I've been living and working that country for 15 years, so I know probably more about the US now than I, than I know about Italy uh, or the other countries. So these are trends from uh, a famous database of two economists, uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez, and show how uh, the distribution of the income has evolved uh, over the last, um, it starts in 1970. Um, so, oh, I think I'm gonna do this. So you can see, uh, this is the, essentially the share of the pie uh, that goes to the top 10% of the population, the top 1% and top 0.1%. So after a period of very high inequality in the, you know, the rolling 20s um, that lasted until uh, World War II, inequality declined and was pretty flat uh, throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s. And the start, um, the rising inequality is really at the beginning of the 80s, and then it's a process that doesn't, doesn't seem to stop. Uh, nowadays, uh, the top 10% uh, of individual command about half uh, of the economic pie of the income in the United States. And if you look down, even the 1% commands almost 20%. And you know this is a very tiny fraction of the population, 0.1%. So we're talking about a few thousand people in the U.S., and they take about 10% of the of the economic pie. So it's a, these are very dramatic trends. Um, these trends actually are not just for the United States. So this is a, an attempt to, to show the same trends for other countries, including Italy. And so as you can see, the the rise in inequality is a very global trend. 
So all the countries in this picture, with the exception of, uh, of France, uh, display a big increase in inequality over the last 30 to 35 years. So it's true in UK, in particular in Canada, so very prominent in Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, but also the um, you know, emerging economies like China and even uh, Sweden, which for us is the, um, the kind of um, uh, example of uh, redistributing, uh, a country where there's a lot of redistribution exhibits a lot of increase in uh, inequality. And Italy actually, after being, uh, after having a very compressed distribution, now it exhibits a lot of uh, inequality. It's actually, uh, these days, one of the most unequal country uh, in, in the world, together with UK. So um, these trends have inspired a lot of uh, uh, interest uh, in the public, not only economists. So the popular interest is soaring as witnessed by the fact that um, uh, the New York Times, for example, runs an almost uh, uh, bi-weekly series on, uh, uh, on the evils of inequality. They call it the Great Divide. Uh, Thomas Piketty is an economist uh, who has written a very popular book called uh, Capital in the 21st Century. This is the most unlikely bestseller in the history of the Harvard Economic Press. <laughs> they will never uh, have dreamt of uh, uh, you know, having a bestseller in the New York Times, uh, you know, hit parade or something. Uh, and there is even a movie by, by Robert Reich, who is a, uh, a Berkeley-based economist, where he actually directs, produces, and even acts, and the movie is called The Quality for All. And uh, in keeping with the interest, there's a lot of uh, you know, popular cartoons, like this one is uh, still burnt. Uh, for those of you who know, it's, there's the dog bird, the CEO who says to his employee, I earn 420 times what you make. That means I'm 420 times smarter. And the guy say, actually, it means the system is deep with flow. And the guy say, well, if you were 420 times smarter, you wouldn't be contradicting your boss right now. <laughs> <laughs> so power is important. So, the trends, it's important to know not only the, 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 the overall increase in equality, but also try to understand where is it coming from. Is it coming from the rich getting richer or from the poor getting poor? And the, the picture is actually quite nuanced. During the 1980s, which is when inequality starts rising, inequality is growing everywhere, okay? It increases at the top, but also the, the middle seems to be doing better than the bottom, the bottom actually seems to do pretty badly. So, during the 80s, it's the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. Then the picture in the 90s is actually a little bit different because uh, the poor actually are, um, are gaining a little bit ground. Then it's the rich that gets increasingly filthy rich. Because uh, this is something that becomes unstoppable. Um, and what are the causes of, uh, of the rising inequality? There's a lot of research by economists about what are the, the reasons uh, why inequality has been rising so much in the US. And we can divide these causes in uh, what are the reasons for why the rich are getting richer and what are the reasons why the poor are getting poor. Uh, so some of the uh, causes behind uh, events that favor uh, the, the rich getting richer are things like skill-based technological changes. These are things that economists um, identify as important reasons for uh, the rise in inequality. So new technologies were introduced in the 1980s. So there was the computerization of the work uh, place. Um, and the guys who um, stood to gain most from the computerization and from the other technologies that were introduced were people with high skills. So people who were well educated and, and so forth. So these people tend to essentially get most of the gain of these new technologies. Those are the guys who uh, make more and more money. Uh, there was also a very slow and creeping uh, change in the norms that were behind uh, pay setting. So if you have seen a movie, Wall Street, uh, there is Gordon Gekko that at some point goes to, an, um, uh, to talk to the shareholders and uh, uh, says this famous sentence, greed is good. So that sentence was really a break from the 70s, the 60s, where uh, the kind of climate was a climate more, you know, we have to be more um, equitable, we have to be more fair, we have to be you know, against uh, you know, giving people um, <laughs> very large pay uh, checks or something like that. So the winner takes it all. Society, if you remember another song from, from the ABBA, uh, from the mm -hmm. 70s, uh, you remember the song, the winner takes it all and the, and the loser standing small. So these were things that became increasingly acceptable even from, uh, uh, from, uh, from a social point of view. 
And then, uh, more technically, there was a, uh, an increasing use among, uh, especially for CEOs, for high-end executives, of uh, performance, um, uh, performance-based pay. Uh, so it was not um, uh, unheard of uh, to have uh, CEOs or uh, large executives to be paid just one dollar for their labor and to have most of their pay determined by fortunes of their firm. And of course, when uh, the firms were doing well, they were reaping a lot of the profits. So what was hurting the bottom instead? Uh, completely different trends. And actually, these are trends that also explain the rising inequality in Italy, if you want to think about it. So most of the institutions that were behind protecting or compressing the wage distribution were just declining in importance and in, uh, in power. So in the United States, the falling we allowed the minimum wage. So the minimum wage was never uh, constantly keeping up with inflation, so which is, you know, they, they let it fall very, very quickly. Minimum wage is usually uh, a good way to keep uh, the wages, especially at the bottom, um, um, kind of keeping up with the, the growth in the economy. The unionization, the process was uh, not as important in the United States, was very important in countries like Italy, in fact. Uh, the, the decline in power of the, the major unions was behind the rising equality that started in the mid-80s. Uh, we have a piece of uh, evidence on the fact that when the, the escalator closed, the scala mob that was abolished, that's when the, 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 the wage distribution started to, to explode. Uh, and at the very bottom, things like international trade, globalization, immigration, especially hurting people working in manufacturing, low skills, because this is where there is competition for for these jobs, these were things that were hurting, especially people at the bottom of uh, for the distribution. So, these are the trends, these are the, the causes, these are the, 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 the research that uh, economists have assembled about why inequality has been arising. So it's more interesting to ask, okay, so why do we care? Who cares about the fact that the guy is making so much money um, uh, relative to somebody at the bottom? So, the reason why the public and hence policy makers and economists uh, care about these trends, you can uh, put it under five different uh, uh, kind of rubrics. Social justice, economists don't have a lot to say about this. Um, intergenerational mobility, financial crisis, um, so inequality has been linked to a financial crisis and therefore to recessions. Uh, this is something that we really care about. Uh, is there a link between inequality and growth in the economy? And finally, what's the impact on wealth, on the measurement of wealth? So I'm going to go through these this five uh, different um, uh, kind of rubrics. But before I go there, uh, before I discuss the evils of, of inequality, uh, there, is, um, uh, there are a lot of economists who think that inequality is actually good. Uh, so there is a very distinct separation between you know, the work of philosophers and sociologists and the work of economists regarding uh, what inequality means. Inequality sometimes is just, inequality of rewards is just representing incentives for people at the bottom, for smart people to actually uh, work, to invest, to create, to innovate. These are forces for good, these are not forces for evil. Um, and according to this view, inequality is actually an engine of growth, not a deterrent to it. So I'm going to come back to this point when I examine wealth. Okay, so let's talk about social justice issues. And this is not going to be, you know, there's not going to be much um, economics here because this is more something that, you know, sociologists and philosophers have done a lot of work on and there's not a lot of uh, contribution coming from, from economists. And I was surprised to, uh, to find that even the, uh, the Pope has some views about uh, inequality <laughs> and social evil. So first I was surprised to see the Pope actually tweet uh, <laughs> at uh, Pontifex. And he says that inequality is the root of uh, uh, social evil. But then it's not surprising, he's the representative of government. So I'm uh, not surprised that he has this view. Um, in terms of uh, what people think about uh, social justice, uh, Pew Research Center runs this uh, service about um, uh, popular views about the unfairness that people perceive about inequality. And one interesting thing, they, at some point they, they interviewed they a representative sample of the US population. They asked whether uh, people felt that there was too much power in the hands of a few rich and whether they felt that the country's economic system was unfairly favoring the wealthy. And uh, the vast majority think that yes, there is a lot of unfairness that is perceived 
Uh, it's interesting that when you cut across the political spectrum, things become very divided. So the, the Democrats, or those who confess, profess themselves to be, uh, to be Democrats, are much more, um, have a stronger sentiment of unfairness or perceived unfairness towards inequality. Uh, while for Republicans, this is uh, much less so, it's much less uh, intense, which is an interesting uh, difference, uh, which speaks to the issue of polarization, which today is uh, something that is a lot, um, that is a lot discussed in, in the United States. Um, the price of perceived um, unfairness, uh, it's well summarized in this quote from, from an economist called Finance Welsh in a paper that was actually entitled uh, In Defense of Inequality. So he says, inequality is destructive whenever the low wage citizenry views society as unfair, when it views effort as not worthwhile, when upward mobility is viewed as impossible or as so unlikely that its pursuit is not worthwhile. And even more extreme, inequality can be literally destructive if it leads to illegal attempts to redistribute. So next time someone breaks in your apartment and steals everything, don't call it a theft, call it an illegal, illegal attempt to, to redistribute. <laughs> from that point. Um, so this is a nice cartoon about proceed and fairness from New York. So the pilot say the flight time today is five hours in first class and twelve and a half in coach. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's my perception as well. <laughs> so second point, very important one is intergenerational mediations. Um, so what's the link? Uh, so it's interesting to think about the Americans, uh, implicit social contract. So the mega social contract is something like that implicitly. So there's, a, let's say, a first generation in which we have a kid from a poor background, a kid from the south of Italy, Luigi, and then we have a Melinda or Linda from a very noble Florentine family, very rich. And then in America, implicit social contract is that when we go to generation two, there is a possibility that ranks could actually um, uh, exchange or switch. So my daughter has, by, his, you know, by her merit, may end up at the, at the top of the distribution of income, and her uh, leader's daughter, for whatever reason, for bad luck, may actually end up uh, at the bottom. So these ranks, these switch of ranks, are not something that uh, have probability of happening. Through meritocracy, through good work, through effort, this is something that may happen. And we call it, in a different way, the American dream. So the idea that even kids from a poor background can uh, get to the top of the economy. So can the rise in inequality stifle that? Uh, there's a concrete possibility that inequality is actually preventing or is destroying the American dream or is transforming the American dream in an American nightmare, as some people have defined it. You know, richer parents can afford to send their kids to better schools or colleges, and we know that better education or a higher quality of education can actually increase the differential in income and therefore uh, perpetuate inequality. There's a huge leadership of the child development leadership so richer parents tend to spend more time, more quality time with their kids, and therefore um, their cognitive um, development is, um, uh, is better than um, what uh, poor parents can do. And if we take a family perspective, economy is called assorted in mating in the marriage market, which means rich sons marry rich daughters. So that's another way of perpetuating uh, existing inequality by, through, the, through the instrument of marriage. And if you look at the relationship between the generation of beauty and inequality, uh, has this kind of shape. So countries where there's a lot of inequality, and US and UK are on top, also countries where there's less mobility in the generation. So I was actually surprised to see Italy up here. So Italy is both a country that exhibits a lot of uh, persistence in mobility. So rich parent is very much predicting a rich son, a rich daughter. And there's also a lot of inequality, but this is a more um, recent phenomenon after the liberalization of, uh, of the labor market. And at the bottom here, countries that have, uh, they're more equal from the point of uh, view of uh, income distribution, also those who exhibit more uh, intergenerational mobility, where uh, it doesn't matter uh, where, you, uh, where you're coming from, you have a chance of going to the top of the economic ladder. Um, in fact, more than American dream, we should probably speak of a Danish dream or Canadian dream. So here, uh, Cherry and Hall have done this, uh, this work where they compare the parent income rank with the average uh, rank in the income distribution of their child. 
And so in the United States, a parent who comes from the very top of the distribution is very likely to have a child who ends up also at the top of the distribution. And this is less likely to be the case when it comes to like Denmark or even when it comes to like Canada, which is um, uh, very close to the United States uh, in terms of uh, uh, geographical market. Now this um, low intergenerational mobility in the United States masks a lot of geographical heterogeneity. So the dark areas are the, the areas where there is very little intergenerational mobility, where uh, which parent is very likely to uh, produce a, a rich son or uh, vice versa. So in fact, we can call it instead of American dream, a Silicon Valley dream, because in the Silicon Valley, the area where, uh, where I live, it's actually one of the parts of the country that is more intergenerational mobility. So a son or a daughter of someone um, who is born and uh, uh, is raised in the Silicon Valley has a higher probability of moving from the bottom to the top than in this part of the country, the east and uh, the south in particular, where uh, the poor kid, an increasingly poor black kid from uh, this part of the country is very unlikely to, to go out in the economic life. Now the third uh, kind of um, uh, consequence or the reason why we should worry about employees uh, is financial prices. So the probability that employees may be linked to financial prices and uh, the reason why this is important these days is that if we think about the most recent global recession, it was actually a financial um, a crisis induced recession. So, this is the reason why uh, economists seem to be worried about this. So, there are two narratives um, that have been proposed to explain the link between uh, inequality and uh, the financial crisis. One was articulated by an economist called uh, Raghu Rajan, who is the current uh, president of the Central Bank of India, who is a Chicago a business school economist. And this is a kind of uh, political economy of supply view uh, of, this, of, this, uh, of this story, while two other economists, both at the Chicago Business School, have a more social network or the map view uh, of, this, of this story. Let me just give you a, a brief summary of what they have in mind. So, Rajan, who is this? Suppose that there is a rising inequality that is due to skill based technological change. So the, uh, those with, uh, with very good skills, very high skills, are the ones who reap the most of the profits or, uh, of the new technologies that get introduced in the labor market. So computerization and so forth. Now the rise in income inequality creates a popular distress. So people are not happy, especially people at the bottom. So there is a strong demand for a distribution which is directed to politicians. Okay. Now, um, wise politicians, would do what? Well, would try to eliminate the, the skill gap uh, due to uh, the introduction of new technology by uh, increasing training or making essential people at the bottom more skilled to eliminate the, the, the skill gap. But you know, these are long term things. And in the long term, we're all dead, as uh, John Maynard Keynes said. And it's especially true for politicians who have suffered from short termism. You know, the next electoral cycle is in four years. The four years are up, and they don't want to do that. So, they might you know, satisfy the demand for, I also want to buy a house, I also want to send my kids to college, I also want to buy the, the car. And the best way to do it is, you know, in a Marie antoinette way, let them eat trade. So they might have um, kind of push for easy lending to go to the poor, um, and that's what in the US is called the subprime mortgage crisis. Essentially lending to people who were not able to afford it, uh, all this borrowing um, that was Thrown at them. The Bertrand and Morse view is a little bit on the demand side, so it's uh, based on what uh, people call the keeping up with the Johnson's view. So when the rich Johnson's get richer, uh, poor people also want to keep up with them. They also want to consume okay, the, the big car, they also want to buy the houses, etc. And so they start, they start saving less, accumulate more, or borrowing more. So, this increase in borrowing, especially unaffordable borrowing at some point, is so in the seats for the financial crisis because this excess borrowing was the reason why the financial crisis happened. And so inequality or increasing inequality may have been behind this, at least in the, in the story that these uh, two sets of economies that uh, are proposed. The evidence is actually mixed. We don't have a lot of evidence that this story actually uh, holds a lot of truth. The most important and I should say the most boring part of the talk is um, what's the effect on inequality on aggregate income and consumption? Because uh, it's important to go through some very um, technical 
uh, kind of concepts in order to go through the idea, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, so the question is whether inequality can have a bearing on economic growth. That's the big question we're asking. And since consumption or spending represents more than two thirds of GDP, it makes sense to ask whether inequality can actually change with the consumption decision of uh, households. Okay. And there is a long history of worrying about inequality and conspicuous consumption. Like you know, this cartoon say, you know, if you pay enough, they'll let you swim with whatever animal you want. A panda or a dolphin. A third experiment that we want to kind of um, conduct is this. Consider me presenting spreading income or a Robin Hood uh, policy leader. So I take from the poor and give it to the rich. This is just an increase in inequality. So the income is less equally distributed, which is what we have witnessed in the last 35 years. Now, can aggregate consumption may have changed because of this third experiment in which we do this Robin Hood policy in reverse? So the answer depends on how different people change their consumption response to change in income. So ask yourself, if I give you an extra dollar, how much are you going to spend on that dollar? Is a poor individual receive that dollar spending it differently than the rich people? If the rich people spend very little, it means that aggregate consumption is going to fall. Okay? If the propensity to spend that dollar is the same for everyone, nothing is going to happen real. You're just changing through that Robin Hood policy. You're going to move in money from the left hand to the right hand. Nothing is going to happen. Okay? So you need a little bit of diversity or heterogeneity in the propensity to consume when I give you this extra dollar or when I take away that extra dollar in order to create some real effects in the economy. Okay? That's when inequality is going to really matter in terms of aggregate consumption. So there is a key parameter here which is called the marginal propensity to consume. So the propensity that different individuals in the population have in consuming that extra dollar that I take you, that I take away, or that I give you. Okay? So there is a lot of research on this, and it's important also for a policy reason. When uh, policy, um, uh, policy makers want to increase how much people consume, uh, they want to give money to people who have the largest margin of to consume. That's when you know, tax rebates or stimulus policies actually work. If I put the money in the hands of people who don't spend anything, the policy is a failure. I want to put money in the hands of those who actually will spend everything. Okay, so the theory actually says, the standard consumption theory says, nothing real is going to happen because everybody has the same NPC. But the theory is wrong. I mean, the theory is based on very strong assumption. So there's a lot of uh, uh, reasons to believe that actually the poor are going to have larger NPC, larger margin of prices to consume. So they're going to more, you know, more likely to go to the, to the, to the mall uh, and spend the extra dollar they receive rather than to the rich. And uh, research that I've done, for example, asking people, what if I give you one extra dollar, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to spend it? How much are you going to spend it? If you look at people at the top of the income distribution, or the cash and hand distribution, the magic price they consume is only about 30%. And if you go at the bottom, so the very poor individual, they have a magic price they consume that is twice as much. Okay? So if you want to maximize the effect of uh, a tax rebate, you would better target this individual, the poor, rather than the rich. So it's a very powerful argument for directing or targeting the poor as recipients of tax stimulus or tax rebates instead of giving it like uh, to everybody. Now, does this matter? Uh, Alan Kruger was the chief economist of uh, um, um, in the Obama administration. Um, produced this kind of experiment, and it's actually the economic report to the President uh, Obama in 2012. The experiment is, is very simple. Suppose that I take all the extra income that has been earned by the top 1% in the last three years, convert it in 2007 dollars, and give it to the bottom 99%, so to everybody else. Okay? And then now let the gains so or the difference in the FTC play out. This calculation, uh, using, for example, my estimate, this would induce a 5% aggregate consumption boost. Okay, so there's a real effect going on, simply uh, coming from this heterogeneity in the margin of propensity to consume. Um, now, this is clearly an upper bound. And it's an upper bound because um, what this calculation, this simple calculation, forgets is that there are these incentives um, uh, playing out. 
So if I know that every dollar that I earn is going to be taxed 100% away and given to the poor, probably I won't be producing that dollar. Okay? I won't put any effort in what I do. Right? I will reduce my effort, I will work less, etc. Et and so you won't have much to redistribute in the first place. But don't say to this to Obama. <laughs> so um, redistributive policies can be potential expansionary, but distortions need to be taken into account. So last issue that I want to touch on is welfare. So this is the only equation I'm going to have, but it's a very powerful equation. It's, it's an equation that was proposed by Marcusen, um, and it's a way of measuring the wealth of an economy. Okay? And there are two things that appear in this equation. Uh, the average income in a country, so when the average income in a country uh, goes up, welfare of the population increases, or wealth of the economy increases. And the other thing that instead brings down wealth, which is inequality. And this measure of inequality is called the Gini Index. The Gini Index is a measure that was invented by uh, an Italian statistician called Gini. Uh, and it's a number between zero and one. So zero means perfect redistribution. So 10% of the people get 10% of the pie, 20% get 20%, etc. One is, uh, there's only one guy who gets everything, and then uh, that's the most unequal distribution you can think of. So what happens when I have an increase in the G? If I keep constant income, unambiguously, an increase in inequality is making everybody in welfare going down. So inequality in that case is totally bad. So there is nothing uh, to argue about this. But, if this increase in gene is accompanied by an increase in the average income of the population is strong enough, inequality may actually be good for you. Okay? That's the, the kind of uh, argument that people who write in defense of inequality uh, actually produce. And this is the argument that is summarized in this phrase. A rising tide that lifts all boat is actually something that is good. There is, yes, an increase in inequality, but we also have an increase in average income, so which may be coming from uh, the, the, the larger reward to, to create jobs, to innovate, etc., etc. But the big question is how do we measure welfare? Is it income or consumption? Uh, and surprisingly, we don't get the same answer, at least in the United States. And there are good reasons to use consumption instead of income. So there is a big fixation, even in the popular press, um, in stressing the importance of the rise in income inequality. But do we see the same trend in consumption? It doesn't matter. Do we see differences? Alan Gritzman, who was the uh, a previous uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, let's give you another authority view together with the poll, a uh, different authority. Uh, Gritzman essentially claims, you know, maybe we better have, um, uh, you know, spend more time or focus or interest in thinking about consumption inequality being a better measure of well-being uh, than income, because in the end, we are happy for what we buy, okay, not for what we get necessarily. Um, why is he right? Or why his argument is right? Well, economic theory suggests that consumption actually be a better measure of material well-being than income, or the standard of living is than income. Income can be a misleading indicator of uh, uh, one's position in the in terms of living standard, because income can be temporarily high or temporarily low. While when you choose consumption, if you decide to buy a house, you don't buy a house because you find you know, $100 bill on the, on, the, on the sidewalk. It's because you have some idea about your long-term income prospects. Okay? That's the idea why consumption can be a better measure. Um, moreover, you can always borrow anything when you buy a house. That's what you do when you uh, have a mortgage. So access to credit, to the ability to borrow, may be important. This is what this is reflected in consumption, but not in income. And if the income inequality increases being of permanent nature, of course, there would be no reason to get different messages. Consumption depends on a permanent measure of income. If income all increases for permanent reasons, then we should get the same kind of message, but actually we don't. And the reason is that um, there is some debate about whether the rising inequality U.S. has been a permanent nature of transitory nature. The permanent nature is things that really change the structure of uh, the wage distribution. Things like steel bars that cannot change. You know, people are uh, you know, getting richer for, for permanent reasons. You're not going to catch up. 
But transitor reasons could be, you know, we could call wage instability. The evidence is a little bit, you know, there is this famous say that when you have two economies, you have three views. And that's true historically here, because early on the evidence was in income inequality is, you know, kind of wishy washy 50% permanent, 50% transitory, and consumption inequality was pretty flat. Okay. So if you measure, remember, the welfare uh, formula, uh, with consumption, um, the message is, yeah, you don't need to worry about the rising inequality because income is growing, consumption inequality is flat, everybody's happy. Okay, even if we have some inequality, it's not uh, something worried, to, to be worried about. Then there is a revision uh, in views, which is essentially better data. And these days, most people think that the rising inequality has been a permanent nature, so it does matter. And there is some research that I have that show that Consumption inequality in the US between 1980 and 2010 has increased by nearly the same amount as income inequality. So the problem is as bad as looking at income inequality. Okay, that's an important revision in the way people think about the rise of inequality. Last thing I'm going to talk about is a sort of case study. The Great Recession in the US is one of the most researched uh, research, uh, recession uh, today because it was big. It was the worst recession since the Great Depression. So it deserves the name that it got. So the, this is income and this is consumption. So a big question that uh, economists have been asked themselves is why do we have this big decline in consumption? Okay. And uh, more importantly, this is the, the gray areas uh, during the recession. And more importantly, why it takes so long for consumption to recover the pre-recession levels? Okay, 100 is essentially the last quarter before the recession. So it takes almost six years for consumption to go back to the level it had uh, uh, before the recession. It's a long time. If you compare it with other recessions, this is the worst of all the recent recessions, starting with uh, the 1973 which was the old shock, and going to more recent 2001. The, the red line is basically uh, consumption of different types of goods, um, and it's the worst by all possible accounts. So why is that? So economists have divided the explanation for this very strong weakness in consumption in two parts. Uh, uh, let's call it impulse and response. The impulse is what puts things in motion. It's the financial side of the economy. So house of balance sheet effects are very damaged because of this extra borrowing. Uh, there are credit supply restrictions. If you want to buy a car and uh, there is no credit available, well, you will not be able to and there was a lot of wealth destruction. People lost a lot of money in the stock market and they also had a chunk of their wealth destroyed because their houses were not worth as much as before the crisis. So they had to reduce their consumption because their expectation of future wealth went down. That's the explanation from the impulse side. Then there's the labor market, which propagates after the initial shock, then you have a propagation because people have, a lot of people in the economy um, have a revision in their expectations about their permanent income. Let me tell you two stories about why this is uh, important. The rise in unemployment is concentrated among permanent job losers, so-called displaced workers. Why is this important? Because the evidence says that if you lose a job, those losses in terms of uh, employment rates in the future and wages are very persistent. So this is people who've lost their job at time zero. They take a big dive in their income, of course, we expect that. But then it takes a long time to recover. And they actually never fully recover the level of income that they were experiencing before the displacement. That's a fact okay, of the labor market in the US and actually of other countries as well. And the other nice things that you see in this graph is that it's very bad to lose a job. It's extremely bad to lose it during a recession. It takes much longer to recover. You actually never recover. You know, you, you have a 20% permanent decline in your wages if you lose a job during a recession. Okay? Simply because, think about a process in which you lose the skills during a period of unemployment, and unemployment just gets longer during recessions. And this recession was particularly bad because for the first time in 20 or 30 years, we had an important phenomenon creeping up, which was long-term unemployment. We thought that this was a European thing. We even have a name for that, Euro-Ice I think. And 
And then we're talking about US hysteresis for the very first time in 34 years. Um, this is an interesting graph that plots unemployment rate historically against the percent earning losses that people experience. And you know, if you drew a line, this is the unemployment rate that was in the US at some point during the Great Recession. So experience expect big earnings losses from this recession. So people who lost a job during the recession essentially expected a big decline in the firm and think of because these losses are very persistent. Another thing important happens, and this is going to be my last thing. There is an increased job polarization. Suppose I divide jobs in the US, and I can do the same exercise in many countries, in three types. There are the so-called non-routine cognitive jobs. And these are jobs where people don't do standard things. Every day they do something different. And they are cognitive because they use their brain. Okay? So these jobs are surgeons. Okay? No appendix is the same. Uh, financial analysts, economists, of course, uh, computer programmers, etc. On the other side of the specter of the of the occupation, you have people who do non-routine, again non-standard things, but they are completely manual jobs. Okay, brain or brain is used, but not uh, you know hand they use more. So these are things like janitors, gardeners, home health aides, plumbers, etc. These people cannot be replaced by a machine or by someone doing that job in India or Pakistan. Over there. You have to, these are so called non tradable. Okay? These are jobs that you have to have hands. The rising inequality is important because these people are getting richer, they can afford to hire these guys. Okay? Which is the reason why these lines here are employment growth. Employment growth for in this occupation is growing in the 70s, sorry, the 80s, in the 90s and 2000s, but there is also positive employment growth in this other occupation. And we call it a theory of slave. You can effectively slave these guys up. Okay? You can afford not producing child care. You don't need to care for your kids because you have the nannies. You can buy a nanny now because you get more income. Okay? I'm pushing the economic side a little bit too far. But this is the idea. But now look at these other jobs. These are called the routine jobs. The routine jobs are things like cashiers, bank tellers, data engineers, machine operators. These are totally substitutable with machines. You know, think about an ATM uh, in Palo Alto. An ATM in Palo Alto, you can do everything you want. Okay, you can get a checkbook, you can deposit a check. You don't need a cash teller to you know, go inside. In fact, the banks are now disappearing, at least the employees in the banks. So these are jobs that are basically disappearing, uh, as witnessed by the fact that employment growth is negative throughout this, um, the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. And this is not a marginal fraction of the labor force. This is about 40% of the labor force holding these kind of jobs. These are the jobs in the 60s would make you middle class. Now there is a middle class help in a whole. It's a kind of dominant thing. And if this is a, in a way it's the theory of trickling down the slaves. So if you have a tax and if you get rich, then you can hire the plumbers, in this case the guys who fix your roof. In the business cycle, these jobs in the routine are being shed as it's normal. So during the recessions, all jobs disappear. But then there is a recovery. So non-routine cognitive, you know, they go down during the recession, but then they recover. It's an upward trend. Same here, there is, they go down during the recession and there is recovery. But look at routine. After the recession, yeah, they don't recover. After the recession, they're completely gone. After the recession, they don't recover at all. So these jobs not only totally are disappearing, they're disappearing very fast not to return. Okay. So people who are in disemployment, in this kind of occupations, they are facing permanent shocks, and they may be behind the revision in consumption that experience the weakness in consumption we see during the recession. So, conclusion. Inequality has increased substantially over the last 35 years. It's a global phenomenon, but an interesting thing is that one within a country inequality is, is going down. When you look between the country, Actually, inequality at the global level is actually diminishing, it's going down. Because you have the new countries, you have the, the, the China, you have the Russia, you have the Brazil, that are actually keeping up, you're kind of catching up with the, with the big economies. What are the economic consequences? Well, the good, uh, the incentives to invest, the poor effort, the innovate, the bad is the fairness. But all this movement of the Wall Street, we are the 99%. So this perceived unfairness is. Um, kind of having social consequences. 
people are not happy about this unfairness or this perceived unfairness. Um, <coughs> that is, therefore, they go for policy to inform or to do other types of interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now uh, opening this up for questions for a, a short Q&A. And Alessio will go around as usual with the microphone. Yes. What? Uh, let me say uh, you've covered so much, it's almost impossible to know where to begin a question or a discussion, but I was interested in your observation about what happens if you give the rich a dollar and the poor a dollar. What if you change that dollar to a percentage figure and you say to the poor, we'll give you or we'll take or give 1% of your income and we'll say to the rich, we'll give you 1% or take 1% from your income. In other words, a dollar figure means a very different thing and so does $1,000 or $10,000 to the rich or the poor, but percentages don't change the equation. Yes, we call it elasticities. So there is also heterogeneity in the elasticities. So that would work in a different way. It may amplify the effects, so it may actually attenuate some of the effects. But um, the kind of uh, qualitative features of the, uh, of the graph that I show will be very similar. But you're totally right. It means, so one dollar for the poor, is a very fraction, very small fraction of what it earns relative to the rich the poor. So you can take that calculation to account. Yes. yes, I'm just curious if um, do economists also study the different value of consumption in the sense that what a rich person buys, what a young uh, poor person buys, the different contributions to yeah, to the economy and to GDP, etc. So how do they study that? Well, there is some research on whether we have more food inequality, for example, versus entertainment inequality. If we have a lot of food inequality, it's worrying. If we have entertainment inequality, we don't really care. So if the distribution, so this is effectively a way to, 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 to address the issue. So what people buy is actually important. So if we were to observe enormous disparities in food expenditure, food consumption, then this would be more worrying. And if you were to observe these parties in you know, the quality of a DVD or a you know, plasma TV or something like that. So some people have actually done that. Um, and um, consumption is a big aggregate. So you observe actually uh, very little inequality when you look at things like necessities. So food, um, uh, rents or something like that. And a huge amount of inequality when you look at you know, luxury. Uh, where the income is are much larger. Yeah. So in a way, it's a little bit less worrying than if you look at, a, at the total aggregate, which confounds all these different measures of necessities and luxuries. Mm -hmm. I have a question too. Now, Matteo Renzi, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you follow this, but <coughs> he gave back 80 euros, you know, the famous 80 euros, we say in Italian, to a certain group of people middle class or low middle class. I don't remember what their, the salary right. uh, needed to be. Do you think that is worth and do you think it responded more uh, uh, to, uh, more than to inequality, but to the idea of setting the uh, economy and the consumption in motion? Is, that, is it responding to that, one of those? That's exactly the, the type of policy that uh, I would sense. advocate and most economists would advocate. You want to put hand, you know, money in the hands of people who are actually going to spend. If the objective is also to have a stimulus. Okay? So the economy, you know, you want to increase consumption because you want to increase income in the aggregate, etc. So the only way to achieve that is to give money, to give a tax rebate, to give some stimulus to people who are going to spend. Yeah. Because then this creates you know, jobs and then there is this, you know, what you call the Keynesian multiplier. There is a multiplier effect that is behind uh, this kind of experiments. So, Matteo Renzi did well. I think what he didn't do well, uh, as far as I know, is that he conditioned uh, the receipt of uh, this income to people who actually had some employment income. 
So uh -huh. those who were completely destitute, who were unemployed, actually don't think qualified for the, mm -hmm. for the state. You're right, you're right. Uh, because I think there was a, a worry that uh, you know, this would go to the rentiers, mm -hmm. okay? For those who have you know, enough wealth, mm -hmm. and wealth is much harder to measure than income. So it's much easier to condition income, but it's very hard to condition wealth. Yeah. And so the word, I think, maybe was legitimate in a country like Italy, it was that a lot of people wouldn't qualify under, you know, I observe everything about your income position would actually get the money. Get the money, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, people were completely you know, unemployed. I'm thinking about my sister, for example, mm -hmm. who didn't get the dollars in the year, she, she was unemployed. And I have another question on the time. Do you have a time frame for those routine jobs that you see as disappearing, probably faster in the U.S. and in Europe? But what would be your time frame? You say next 50 years, we'll have no bank tellers, or next 10 years, what would be the time frame? Oh, I would say it's very fast. They're going very fast. The next 10 years, I don't think we have, you know, if you go to a bank in the United States, I don't think you have a you know, bank teller anymore. You have what they call bank advisors. They are basically selling you products. Mm -hmm. They're not doing services. Mm -hmm. This is already a trend that we see in the United States, at least in some parts of the country. So those jobs, in a way, are already gone. Mm -hmm. So they have to have you know, one guy sitting behind the desk because you know, there might be some very particular operation, like you want to do an international draft, and it's mm -hmm. very complicated to do it without a, you know, a man or woman behind the desk. But those jobs, you know, those who were like cashing your checks or something like that, they're already gone. You know, banks are really places where they sell you <coughs> things. They don't provide services. The service at the uh, ATM, or you do it online. Mm -hmm. There's been some books on robots lately that have projected the nature of the workforce in the next decade. Yeah. And none of the people that you've listed there are going to have jobs at all. No. They're all going to be closed. They're, they're gone in history. Yeah. Ten years, they say. So the policy here is important because these guys are, you know, these jobs are disappearing, but these people are not disappearing, mm -hmm. okay? No, so what are we going to do with these people? Well, we don't know. That's the problem. Yes, some, will become, the problem. some will become plumbers, okay? Some will become gardeners. Now, for some people, you know, maybe you call it dignity, private side, it's going to be very hard to move down, okay? Because it's, there's a social class kind of view. We are middle class, we're not going to... Some people will retrain, perhaps, to go up on the scale. So. There's an age issue there, so people are young enough to reap, you know, human from human capital investment will actually retrain, get their skills revamped, and then they can move up. So the big challenge for the policy is where to him how to address this problem, how to make sure that these people are not lost. But their training is going to be in things like physiotherapy and things of that kind, yes, which, is, which is not the kind of occupation that. But the other question I wanted to ask you while I've got the microphone is, I've now forgotten, but it was along the lines uh, that the question of consumption does matter, uh, the nature of it does matter to those who are in policy making and welfare because they get fronted if a person who is unemployed but on welfare goes to a restaurant and buys lobster and champagne because they're not supposed to do that because they're supposed to be poor and yes. unemployed and they're getting welfare. So the consumption question does matter even in the question like that yes. for those who are opposed to it. Yes, and this is the reason why food stamps in the US um, can only be used in uh, some grocery stores and not in restaurants uh, and why you cannot buy alcohol or you know, liquors. So there's a paternalistic view about, I'm giving you money, and I tell you what to do with the money. Mm -hmm. Now, this paternalistic view, I don't necessarily agree with, so it could be just welfare money, do whatever you do. So some people really have a strong view about what people should do with welfare money, and this is the reason why food stamps are based very restrictive. Mm -hmm. And why in some developing countries like Mexico, our programs actually not only uh, don't give money or stamps, they actually give goods in kind. And this creates just a big you know, market exchange. In some Mexican villages, people get beans. And then the, the day after the deliveries has occurred, you see people essentially exchanging, OK, I have the, you know, the wheat, and you give me the beans. So the barter economy <laughs> is essentially um, funded on the basis of this uh, 
this so-called in-kind world of progress. It's like actually quite fascinating. We'll take one final question from one of our students. Um, actually, I think that's a really interesting segue because at the beginning of your talk, you also mentioned that there's not too much discourse, especially from sociological, uh, philosophical, or other fields that might otherwise be intersectionally related to this issue. So I guess I'm wondering, um, in your opinion, why do you think there hasn't been that much conversation between these different fields? And I mean, I know I have my own personal ideas of some of the benefits, but what do you think are some of the most important things that um, possibly we can learn from considering other fields? So for example, considering the intersectionality of race or the intersectionality of like geographical location, gender, and all these things. How do you think other fields could actually contribute to that discussion, given the points that you're making here? Um, it's a hard question because economists don't mix with sociologists very what? Uh, well. Uh, so if you're a bad economist, you become a sociologist. <laughs> but I think we learn a lot. So there is a, what we call an economic imperialism. So we actually take, uh, it was a sack. Um, things from the different fields and then convert it into an economic language. For example, social networks, the importance of social networks uh, had been long completely neglected by economists until very recently when we started to, and social networks are you know, an invention of sociologists. We assumed that our agents, our people were atomistic, so they were acting without considering what you know, people around them were doing. And this is very much changing. In the same way as we're drawing a lot from psychology uh, in thinking about people meeting you know, or acting what we call behaviorally. So not as rational agents maximizing utility, but sometimes just making mistakes. And so some mistake may be you know, borrowing when you cannot afford it, okay? Which you know, is some behind some of what I said. Social networks may perpetuate inequality especially in, uh, in areas where you, know, you go on welfare, it starts uh, being socially transmitted, so disease, there's a welfare culture, and that actually perpetuates poverty. So we're learning a lot from, from other fields, but without you know, writing joint papers with sociologists, but just kind of drawing a lot of uh, uh, what sociologists have written about, or what psychologists have written about, and morphing it into an economic discourse. But if you expect a lot of interdisciplinarity, that's my personal experience, between sociologists, psychologists, economists, you're not going to see much. That's my, you know, perhaps dismal science view uh, of, uh, of how research on this topic is proceeding. It's not proceeding like interdisciplinary, like in parallel. But economics is a social science. It is a social science, right. and so is sociology. So, so I mean, you know, it, it doesn't make sense that one doesn't lead into the other. But the inequality I'd like to ask you about is this great uh, pending disaster that's going to happen fairly soon. Well, it's happened already. It's just got to uh, materialize, and that is the inequality between money supply and debt. I mean, your money supply is about $78 trillion in the world, global, and your debt is at $230 trillion. Um, you know, and it's escalating something like 54% over the last 10 years. Um, where's that going? And actually, who do we all owe this money to? Uh, to each other. To each other. Yeah, to so ourselves. actually we could sort of realize a world, wake up tomorrow, jubilee, debt-free world, if we just made that decision. Well, money supply is not creating a lot of inflation. In fact, the problem is there's not too much inflation these days. It's interesting. Yes. I mean, we have a, actually the opposite problem, surprisingly. Despite the massive injection of cash by Federal Reserve, by ECB, by all the central bank in the world, we are in a world in which there is what economists call the zero lower bound. So we cannot stimulate consumption by reducing interest rates. Guess what? Because interest rates are very low, zero. Actually, in the United States, with the policy that the, the, the Federal Reserve has conducted in the last 10 years, 
we have interest rate actually negative in real terms. So that part, the, monetary, the, the, the crucial role of monetary policy is lost. So money supply is not a problem. Debt, uh, in contrast, is a problem. And this is the reason why the, the, the good recession actually happened. It happened because there was too much debt, and only by, uh, there was too much debt by all the possible economic agents you can think of. There was too much debt on the government side, there was too much debt on the corporate side, there was too much debt on the household side. So one good thing about the Great Recession is that it was a wake-up call. Guys, you cannot borrow beyond your means. And what you have seen is what we call the leveraging. All the institutions, these three actors, have started reducing the level of their debt. And the recession comes from that. People refrain from spending, corporations refrain from investing, and governments refrain from you know, giving welfare. That's a recession. But actually, it's just a concept in our mind. It's something that um, the overborrowing can be stopped, and we have seen a form of stopping in the last five years. The excesses you know, can never be stopped, but it's, it's going to be the next, um, it's surprising, like the next last 10 centuries, people have always been going through you know, waves of financial crisis induced by overborrowing or by what we call manias or panics. So this was just one big example of it. Um, but there have been many. Thank you very much. Thank you.